one of our primary endpoints is the six-minute walk test, which is how far can you walk in six minutes? And so from the earlier studies that our company did, we found a significant increase after the stem cell infusion in the amount of, in the distance that people could walk, almost the length of a football field from having the infusion. Welcome to the Regenerative Warrior Podcast, Doctor's Edition. One of the fastest growing regenerative medicine and anti-aging podcasts in the world. Each and every Tuesday and Thursday, I talk to the top experts to show doctors how to market, manage, and magnify their practice to help more people and make more money. Each episode is short and to the point without wasting your time with pointless conversation. Learn the skills to be successful without traveling to seminars or paying for expensive consulting fees. Are you ready? Because I am. I'm Dr. Ross Carter, and it's time to start the Regenerative Warrior Podcast now. 2 things before we get started. The views expressed by our guests are not necessarily those of Dr. Carter or this podcast. One of our podcast partners has just announced special pricing for our listeners. Wharton's Jelly Allograph for $475 per cc. You heard that right, only $475. White papers are available. This is for a limited time, so act now. Why pay double or triple the price from other providers? To learn more or to order, text your name and the word JELLY, J-E-L-L-Y, to 561-962-1231. Write that down. It's 561-962-1231. On with the show. Hi, this is Dr. Ross Carter with the Regenerative Warrior Podcast. I'd like to introduce my guest today, or I'd like her to introduce herself. Sure. My name is Suzanne Page. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Longevron. Longevron. Excellent. So can you tell us a little bit about Longevron? What's the mission of Longevron? Sure. So Longevron is a cellular therapy company. We were founded in 2014. We spun off from the University of Miami. Our founder is a senior researcher and physician at the university, and he invented some technology there, which he exclusively licensed to form this company. So it's your traditional tech transfer evolution. And we manufacture a product called the mesenchymal stem cell, which is derived from adult bone marrow. We manufacture that product in our GMP facility here in Miami, just a few miles from where we are, adjacent to the University of Miami Medical School. So... Originally, the company was created to continue clinical trials that had started at the university in uh, phase one uh, in the indication of aging frailty. And at the university, they were using a similar mesenchymal stem cell. And so with the licensure of the technology, we continued with that process of conducting the clinical trials. And really, ultimately, the goal is to have FDA approval to make this LMSC, we call it, the Longevron mesenchymal stem cell, the standard of care to treat aging frailty. Perfect. So let's define what aging frailty is. Okay. So aging frailty is a very well-pronounced indication that affects, it depends on the age bracket you're in, but over 20 million people in the United States are suffering from some form of frailty, whether it be pre-frail or frail. It's a confluence of symptoms. It could be reduced grip strength. It could be diminished cognitive skills. It could be evidenced by falling. It could be unintentional weight loss. You're walking more slowly. You can't walk as far. You have a loss of independence. And it's a gradual, in most cases, disease. Is aging frailty different than just being old? I would say so because, you know, there's definitely two schools of thought on how to measure, if not more, the syndrome which there's the Canadian scale, and there's also what's called the Freed scale, Linda Freed, who's the dean of Columbia University. And there's different ways to test it. And there are very objective measurements of this. So there are some people that can exhibit symptoms consistent with aging frailty at an age younger than other people who aren't necessarily exhibiting these symptoms. So basically, they suddenly lose all this Not necessarily suddenly, but it's quantifiable in terms of grip strength. So for our clinical trials, for example, it was important when we spoke with the FDA about how to design the trial, you know, we needed certain primary endpoints. So for example, one of our primary endpoints is the six-minute walk test, which is how far can you walk in six minutes? And it's as simple as that. And so from the earlier studies that our company did, we found a significant increase 
after the stem cell infusion in the amount of, in the distance that people could walk, almost the length of a football field from having the infusion. As compared to what was it before? What they were at baseline. Okay. So we do a baseline measurement, and in one of our clinical trials, we do the measurement twice, and there has to be a certain percentage. There can only be a certain deviation between the two tests. Right. And then we measure it after the stem cell is infused. So that's one of our How criteria. long after do you check the improvement? Well, each trial is a little bit different, but we follow up. We have 30, 60, 90, 120. And so it's multiple times. times. Yes. So we're, there's uh, more than one, there's more than one follow up. We also use a biomarker, okay. which is TNF alpha, which is tumor necrosis factor. And so that's a very objective way because one school of thought is that frailty and a lot of diseases are associated with high degrees of immunosenescence and also inflammation within the body. So we test for that. And so we test for that depending on the trial. It's done at screening and baseline. In some of our trials, it's an inclusion factor. And then we test for it after the stem cell. So did the presence of the stem cell show or correlate to reduced inflammation, reduced TNF alpha? A third generalized outcome measure is a patient-reported outcome. Just talking, you know, people do assessments. They say how they're doing. So you have that nice balance of objective and subjective outcomes. Right. So now you're using bone marrow. Correct. Stem cells. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not on the patient, though, right? It's not from the actual patient that's having the condition. Correct. So we're using someone else. Right. So there's two. I'm sure there's more than two. But generally speaking, there's autologous, yeah. which just means it's your stem cells My comes own. out of your own body and goes back into you. That's what you generally see if you're driving down the highway and you see a sign for stem cells in the United States. Right. That's what it is. Right. Although our founder has done some very sophisticated clinical trials using autologous sure. cells versus the second type, which is allogeneic. Allogeneic means it comes from a third-party donor. So we work with vendors to get young, healthy donors to donate their bone marrow. So you're using someone else's bone marrow that are young. Well, what's the average age? What you're Generally in the early 20s, we oh. go 18 to 45, but we find most donors tend to be in their early 20s. Sorry for the interruption again. To find out more about this speaker, become a speaker on our show, have Dr. Carter present at your event or podcast, learn more about coaching, consulting, tissue allografts, exosomes, supplements, legal health, or how to create a million-dollar business card and dominate your area, we're here to help you. Just text your name and any question to 561-962-1231. Write that down. That's 561-962-1231. Or go to our website at drrosscarter.com to learn more. Don't forget about our current $475 Warden's Jelly Special. On with the show. From a standpoint, I would think that using somebody else's bone marrow might cause a rejection or reaction. Um, we haven't really seen that to be the case because it's agnostic in a sense. So we don't have to, uh, we do do some HLA testing, you know, if someone receives more than one infusion from mm -hmm. us. Yeah. But we've found that it's been, for lack of a better scientific word, agnostic. So yeah. that it's not like you're donating a kidney and you have to make sure that you don't have any type of antigen that would cause a rejection. Yeah. That hasn't been the case. So you're using pure stem cells, not a mixture of different types of cells, or is it just, what is it? Just stem cells. The aspiration is done from the hip, and everything we do is done with, under FDA oversight. So you know if you're getting our stem cells, right. the FDA has scrutinized how we obtain the bone marrow, who we use, who our vendors are, how we culture and expand the cells, what we test on the cells before they are released for use in humans, all our protocol. I mean, unlike some other clinics that you would see, everything we do is done under an FDA-approved protocol. So you expand these cells, and about how many cells do you get, uh -huh. approximately? Well, you know, we're kind of dipping a little bit into our trade secrets. Oh, I'm um, sorry. But Didn't know that. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> Just a lot. But we are really proud of what we've accomplished in uh -huh. terms of scaling up, and we've had a lot of success maximizing the number of cells and therefore doses from a particular donor. So how does the cells get into the person's body? They are um, just IV. IV infusion. Into the arm. Gotcha. So you do that how often? Well, you know, it depends. The protocols that we currently have open yeah. are single dose. 
Just one time. Just one time. The trials that our founder did at the university, I know that he did go back and do multiple dosing. That was a small sample size. Our trials are right now are one-time infusion. And you don't like do a follow-up uh, annually, or is no. that it? No, the trials are about 12 months start to finish. Oh, okay. So that's for the trial. Yeah. So have you done any follow-ups like a year or two later to see if they've come down or they've improved or what happened? Well, I mean, our data isn't unlocked yet. It's still, it would be premature. Right. So you really don't have a lot yet on that. We have some data, but mm -hmm. nothing. I would think that would be really public. interesting to do it as an annual thing. You know, on your birthday, you get an infusion of life rejuvenating cells. I think that would be an awesome thing. Mm -hmm. And I do think that would probably be the standard of care over time. I think that should be a birthday present for everyone. <laughs> exactly. So it helps with aging frailty. Is there any other conditions that you guys are working with? Yes. So we have a phase one trial going on with Alzheimer's disease. Oh, that's excellent. Yes. And we're very proud of that. We received a prestigious award from the Alzheimer's Association. Oh. It was called a Part the Cloud Challenge, and it was a competitive award. And we were one of the recipients, and we're just finishing up that grant with the Alzheimer's Association and have applied for additional funding. Is that a published thing? Not published yet because the trial is still ongoing. So oh. we are about 15 patients enrolled out of the 30. So when will you have some research published or anything? Do you have, Probably do you 2020. 2020? Okay. So... Uh... We have to finish enrollment in 2019, which I feel strongly that we will do. And then, you know, obviously finish the trial and all the subsequent visits and right. then analyze the data yeah. and have it prepared in a state that it can be shared publicly. Man, that would be life-changing for some people. That would be great. I mean, it's a safety trial. Yes. So really what we're looking at is safety, some efficacy analysis. But, you know, with the failure of so many potential treatment options for Alzheimer's disease, it's good to sort of think outside the box and look yeah. at different types of therapies. And so you're doing it for that. Is there any other conditions that you're working with? Yes. So we have the two aging frailty trials. One is done in connection with the flu vaccine, and it's to see if the presence of our stem cells in someone enhances the body's immune response to the flu vaccine. So it's to see, does the presence of our cells make your body respond more favorably to the flu vaccine? So in other words, you get a better immunity to the flu. Right. Oh, okay. Interesting. And so, you know, and that's been really timely because of, we've had a couple of really bad flu seasons. Okay. So we've had tremendous interest in that trial. And that trial is funded in part by the Maryland Stem Cell Research Fund. Maryland Stem Cell? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So we're proud of that. Yep. The Phase 2B trial is funded by the National Institutes of Health, okay. NIA, National Institute on Aging. A sub-study to the two trials we just discussed, the Phase 2B and the flu vaccine trial, is we're testing the metabolic syndrome, and that's also NIH-funded. It's an SBIR grant, and the metabolic syndrome is, again, it's sort of a combination of symptoms in terms of it can be, you know, waist circumference, and it's a lot of different metabolic-type issues. A lot of the patients who have aging frailty, or a significant percentage of them, also suffer from the metabolic syndrome. So that has done well. And then, of course, we talked about the Alzheimer's disease trial. And then finally, we have, which isn't really an aging trial, but we thought it was really important to our portfolio. It's called the hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And this is an ultra-rare pediatric indication. Oh. The children are diagnosed in utero that they're going to be born with this condition where part of their heart is missing or highly compromised, and the uh, mortality rate is quite high. So they have to go through a series of surgeries, and during one of their surgeries, our cells are direct injected into the heart. Oh, wow. And is this a, a brand new study, or have you been doing it for a while? We've been doing it for about a year. Has there been any positive outcomes? Well, again, it's, Too it's early. a safety study, ah. and data is not unlocked yet. So it just sounds like you're really going after some fantastic things. I mean, people are getting older. There may be hope to. What would you think would be just trying to keep you, as you get older, as strong as possible at your age instead of just falling off the cliff kind of thing? I think that's great. And Alzheimer's, which is obviously a huge problem for right. so many people. so And it's a worldwide affliction, these diseases. You know, some of the cultures, especially in Asia, where the population in uh, China, mm -hmm. Korea, Japan, they have very high aging population. So the term aging frailty is a little more widely known in Europe or Asia than it is in the United States, even though it's a bona fide disease.